Good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you about some of Dad's artwork and to tell you some of the backstory, like I'd like to say the rest of the story about some of his paintings that some of you may have heard some of these stories and some of you may have not. But I think it's important uh, to give some relevance to um, to the images that you see, you know, because, you know, when you see the image, it's just just a painting and to know the backstory is to make it such a so much more of a rich um, experience with the painting. So um, when I looked at this body of work that uh, they wanted me to kind of speak about, I thought about um, my dad and his values and um, the things that were important to him and how those things are reflected in his artwork. Um, so one of the things, of course, that's most, that's most important to him is family. And I think that you'll see the family thread of, um, you know, his value through a lot of his work where he wanted to picture family and make everything relevant to that. Um, also, independence was something that was very important to him. And independence is something that's important to all of us. But, you know, it had special meaning for him because, you know, he was born with cerebral palsy. And um, so he had limited control of his arms and his hands, and um, he couldn't walk. Uh, so, you know, independence to him was being able to get around and being able to do obviously the things that everyone else wants to do. And so that's one reason that independence, he was strongly independent. Um, that That's one of the themes that I kind of see in his um uh, in his artwork and throughout his life. Um, the, another thing that I saw as one of his, uh, the things that were important to him was uh, relevance to the community or, you know, uh, friends and involvement with the community. So those are things that I kind of want you to think about. And I want, while we're talking about and looking at his paintings, if you would think about them from that sort of reference and also you know, from the reference that when he was painting these paintings and experiencing some of these experiences, you know, he was in a wheelchair and with limited use of his limbs. And so I think that's really important. That was something of a characteristic of himself that he wasn't really wanting to move, to put forward in the front of the lens about his artwork because he wanted people to purchase his artwork and to like it based on his skill and not based on, oh, I feel bad that he was handicapped and he's made this artwork and so let's buy it. You know, so that's, but but to me, it's really important now that, especially that he's gone, to look at this body of work and to appreciate that that's kind of where he's coming from, you know, that that's part of what the challenge that he had. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna go through some of these paintings and talk about some backstory if I can work this technology. Okay. Okay, this one, After the Storm, this was a very tall painting that's like this tall, and it was always prominently in our home when I was growing up. Um, so I grew up looking at this um, my entire life, and, you know, I would stand on our floor furnace in our old house and burn my sneakers, you know, uh, looking at this and, and picturing what was, you know, what was going on. So if you'll look at the painting, you can see a huge sky that's stormy. And uh, down, if you look down below, it's not very big, but you can see my grandmother on the porch of the old frame house. So that is dad's mother. And uh, you can see us uh, that the road out front of their home was is dirt. Um, you can see the railroad tracks there. That is rendered as it pretty much was. Uh, and that place was on North Short L Street, if I'm not mistaken, near the railroad tracks. So now it's a vacant lot, but that is as it was pictured. So the, the, this painting has, to me, it has two kind of stories that go with it. So dad told me about the, the, the night that this, the day that this storm came through, this was really an event that he painted from memory. 
And what he told me was he wanted to do a painting that showed a stormy sky. And of course, this memory came to, to him, you know, to feature the home and, you know, about the storm. So what he said was that um, his mother was very afraid of storms, that she was terrified when it would start to thunder and lightning. And uh, so it got uh, stormy. And he said that he and his uh, sisters were huddled up on the bed, on grandma's bed. Like I pictured that grandpa was at work, maybe, because they were huddled up and scared to death because it was stormy. Well, so he said that it would um, it would lightning and it was darkish and then it, the lightning would light up everything and then it would be dark and rumbly and and he said that she was just shaking. Grandma was just holding her children, and um, so directly he said he heard an instantaneous boom and lightning just instantaneous and and the house shook and the dishes in the cupboard shook and rattled. And he said that he thought that grandmother later had to maybe change out the coverlet that was on the bed, you know, <laughs> after that. But so then after the storm cleared, they went outside on the porch. And of course, the yard was full of water and the lightning had struck the sweet gum tree out front. And so that's what you see here. The tree has been struck by lightning. If you look real close in that image. So, um, so that was the story about the storm and how what happened that day with the storm. So another story about this painting that comes to my mind is um, if you look uh, out front, the street over here, I can't get too close. I can't see if there's like children here. I'm, I'm not sure. But where the water is collected there in the ditch, he said that that he liked to play in that street because he was a boy. And uh, he, uh, you know, because we're back in 1940-ish, 40-ish something. Um, he didn't have a wheelchair. So, but he didn't let his lack of a wheelchair or mobility to stop him from getting places and doing things that he wanted to do. And so he would crawl everywhere he went. So he said that his mother dressed him in overalls so that he wouldn't crawl out of his clothes. <laughs> um, but he liked to get in this ditch in the front, he said, because when it was really rainy and muddy, it would dry. And then there was a rut, a big rut in the road where the cars would drive. And he was a little boy. Of course, he said, I would crawl in that rut. And he said, I would look to my right and I would see a big wall of mud, a big wall. And then I would look to my left and I'd see another big wall. And he said that he would, he said I would try to crawl through that rut. And um, he said I would picture as the cars were going that how they go and the dust goes up behind the car. You know, it rolls when it's been muddy and everything. He said I would crawl and he said I would put it in high crawl gear. <laughs> and I would, I would try to crawl out the other end of that rut and then I would look back to see if was I stirring up the dust that the cars like the cars would and uh, he said that I pictured that I was a uh, superman and that I might have a cape going out behind me you know flying out <laughs> so um, those are things I think about when I look at that painting can I ask yeah uh, one other the maybe you told me or Jim was it the kids would carry him out to play? Uh, they put him on a blanket, and they'd be outside at some age, and then a big old loud train would come down that track, mm -hmm. and they all would run inside to get away from the noise and, and leave him out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he uh -huh. said, "Well, I think he told that to a man he was in the train club with the man." Mm -hmm said, John, what, when did you start liking trains? Mm -hmm. It was at that time at a young kid, he thought, well, I better like them because there's nothing I can do about it. Because <laughs> he was out there right with them. That's right. Well, trains are a theme in his life that went, you know, he was a model railroader and he did like trains. And so you're right. That was one of the things he said, well, I might as well get used to face this fear of this train rumbling because I, I, he couldn't go, he couldn't run inside like the other children. So, 
All right, this one is called Separate Grandmas. This is again, another painting that's hung in our home while I was growing up, because it, it's maybe older than me, I'm not sure. Um, so if you look um, at the stove is um, my dad's grandmother. So um, does anybody, ha have you seen or used a, an old stove like that before? Yep. That was a wood burning stove. Yep. He said that he saw that <laughs> grandmother would open that door and it was like a dragon and she would shove wood in there. And uh, of course, anyway, so she's making some rolls or something there. And so those are, you know, his grandparents. And he said that he would have been um, a child, you know, playing on the floor. And so when I was younger, I pictured that he was maybe under the table or something and I couldn't see him, but he's not, you know, he's not pictured here. But it's interesting to, to look and I would, spend my time looking at the table and trying to decide what food was on the table. You know, what is that? So you can see uh, there's some pies on the in the window on the um, little table by the window and there's some potatoes on the floor under that table. And um, it's just the setup that would be any kind of family meal. Um, and so that's probably my grandmother and her siblings. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. So, um, but I th I like this painting, I th and I think it's um, you know one of the more family reflective paintings that he's done. So let's see. Okay, the one uh, this one's called Blueberry Pickers. This one he did for my mother from a memory that she had as her, from her childhood. Um, so um, you can see the little train, the viaduct that's underneath the train track and um, the, the children are picking blueberries and they've got a whole, they got a whole big bunch of blueberries there, don't they, in that basket. Uh, so that would be um, her, my, my mother and her brother, I'm guessing probably Charles, who Charles was a couple of years younger than mother. Um, and the, the timing on this would have been, what did I say? 48 or 49, maybe 1948, because uh, when mother was seven, she caught polio. And so she wasn't able to walk, you know, like this. She This is picturing her standing. And so this would have been when she was younger than seven with Uncle Charlie. Um, she said that they liked to pick the blueberries and they would eat them or take them back and have grandmother make a pie or something with them. Also, they liked to get in that tunnel thing under the railroad track when the train would go over and it would shake and they would, you know, hang on and let it shake them. So that was, um, that was one of her best memories that she told dad about and he painted that as a gift to her. So I think that's precious that when you think about it from that standpoint. Also, uh, some of, some more backstory on on this is, um, you know, my mother uh, she got polio when she was seven. That was 1950 or 51, um, and my uncle Charlie also got polio. Um, and my grandmother, mom's mother, worked. Uh, as a, uh, she ran a cafe. It was called the Highway 71 Cafe. And I understand it was on Zero Street where it turns, where that street turns. Anyway, she wasn't able to go with the children to Children's Hospital and, and stay because she had to provide for her children. She had to, because although she married more than once, she was most frequently the only breadwinner. Um, so they were, Uncle Charlie and my mother, were treated at Children's Hospital in Little Rock, and they were housed at some place called the uh, Children's Convalescent Center. And that is a building in Jacksonville that's on the edge of the Jacksonville Air Base. So now that is a little museum that's there, but that's where she was housed at the time when they would, I guess, take them to Children's Hospital for treatment, uh, you know, for the polio. But uh, she said that when she, because initially she was completely paralyzed 
with the polio. And Uncle Charlie didn't have as severe of a case of polio, and he was able to get around. He ended up with a right side weakness, you know, looked like a stroke kind of, where he had real weak, and he walked with a cane a lot in his later years. But so she said that he would um, look out the window and tell her things that he was seeing out the window because she wasn't able to get up and look out. So, um, you know, so that this picture has special relevance to me because, of course, it shows her standing and it shows the two of them and their special relationship that they had. That's also watercolors. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Oh, this one. So the story about this, um, back, back, um, so John Bell graduated from the University of Arkansas with a degree in art and education uh, in 1965. And um, at that time, of course, there was no ADA law to protect people from discrimination. There was not any laws to make buildings accessible. So he, he finished this degree at a university um, that was not accessible to people with disabilities. So he, he had a one of those mechanical push wheelchairs. I don't know how he managed to get up those hills at, at Fayetteville. But anyway, so the fit, I'm saying that the fact that he graduated with this degree was a great uh, honor or a great achievement for him because of what he had to do to get through that. But also, when he finished, he wasn't able to get a job. So um, he came home, at, you know, at the end of, he, when he graduated, uh, of course, his uh, scholarship or his sponsorship with, at the university came to a close. He didn't have a home or a way to support his wife and child. So what happened was um, he went to live with his um, sister, Aunt Lee, and, and my Uncle Bill family. They took him in, and Mother and I went to stay with some of her family for a while. Now, I was brand new, okay, and just I was just eating groceries, you know, that he was trying to buy. So he, <laughs> it was a dark time uh, at that time for him. So um, in order to make any money, he, he started painting, doing portraits, you know, which uh, anything that he could do to bring in any money was desirable because he had, was, again, was fiercely independent and he was in this situation where he, he couldn't provide for his family and we were apart and he didn't know what he was going to do because he thought he was going to graduate from the university with a degree. He was well qualified. He had, a, a, you know, a reputation and that he would get a job, but it didn't work that way. So what happened was he sent resumes all over the nation for jobs. And in the meantime, he painted portraits and did charcoal portraits and everything else, trying to bring in a little bit of money. Um, and what he said about the portraits uh, to me was that um, doing portraits was for someone that has an education, a university education in art, that those portraits were very confining and constricting work because they have to be rendered photographically. Because if you don't look like you think you look, then you're not happy with the portrait, right? So um, he said that was a, an endless parade of smiling faces that had to be rendered photographically. And so the question is, why don't you just take a picture? However, I'm just telling you the backstory about what his... Attitude was, and so whatever. But so he did portraits of everybody that would sit for one, that needed one in order to bring in some money. So here he was in this situation, um, and he said that he was sleeping during the daytime and awake at night. And he would, you know, so he said he woke up on a night, of course, it was storming outside, you know, and stormy nights are probably a theme of his also. He woke up and he was looking out the window and it was raining against the window pane and he saw his reflection. And he said it, he said um, that, you know, the lightning would strike outside and it would illuminate and he would look one way and then the rain would hit the window and he would look another way. And he said he thought, this is perfect. 
This is amazing um, because it's not the endless parade of smiling faces. It's real life, how life can be. It's not always perfect and smiling. Sometimes it looks like this. And also that's an interesting um, take on a portrait because again, it's not perfect, but it shows a lot of how life can be this way. So what he said is I saw that and I got out my paints and I was um, inspired. And uh, so he said, I sat there at three in the morning and did this portrait. And he said, slowly, this is what appeared on the canvas. And he said, I was, uh, I felt when I woke up the next day, I felt a whole lot better because it's almost like he got this out of his system. And uh, so as long as I can remember that portrait was hanging in wherever he worked at the house, in his studio, his home studio. He got some space at the um, art museum, at the art, um, Fort Smith Art Center. And uh, his dad and some of their friends uh, remodeled an old carriage house there. And I think that's the Clayton house. Is that right? Do you know? Uh, Von Shep. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so he made a little studio there on the side of the um, art center. And that's where he worked. And he, um, he painted portraits and he taught lessons and he sold art supplies. And that was his uh, studio called The Pallet. Mm -hmm. So there's some pictures of him at The Pallet back here. Um, so anyway, then, of course, all of us moved into an old house on South 11th Street. So we were all together and he was making money and things turned around. But for a minute, you know, it was like this. So this painting is, um, I call it the yellow umbrella. This painting is kind of like the flip side of the dark portrait. Um, this looks like just, you know, just a patio table, but the backstory is, you know, more rich than that because that represents uh, our backyard. You know, for a little while we lived in a house that was really adjacent to Fort Smith Northside you know, right there on the, behind the gym. So if there, if this was an actual photograph, you would see the gymnasium kind of pictured in that white space back there. Um, and what you see on the other side of the table is a wood pile. Now this is covered in snow, so you can't see it that well, but that's a wood pile for the fireplace. So um, what I remember, what this painting brings up is memories of us, but out there in the yard, we dad loved to be outside and he would always sit at the patio table with a glass of iced tea. And he, that was his favorite thing. And he would listen to the crickets or the cicadas or Northside had a tower with a lot of bats that lived in there and they would fly. And when it got that twilight, you could hear them and see them flying around. And so it was all like that. And if you if you know what it is that connects us with community and people, it's food is one thing, right? So we always had one of those cheesy, cheap grills out back, you know, <laughs> where there would be a hot dog or a hamburger or something grilling up. And so that's the kind of uh, memories that I have uh, from looking at this painting, even though this is picturing it in the snow. So I remember after Dad had passed away, Mother had that painting it, she had that painting in her bathroom and I would go in there and see it and I'll be like, you know, I want that painting. And, and so she was kind of giving stuff away and I was like, Mom, can I have that? She said, no. <laughs> but that's the reason why, because for her, it was the same thing. It was all those memories balled up into that, that one painting. So um, that's what I like to think about when I look at that one. All right, so the cabin on the lake, um, the story behind that one, of course, mother and dad found this cabin. It's, um, it's um, on Lake Greenleaf, which is near Lake Tenkiller in Oklahoma. So um, it's just a small lake, uh, but that cabin was built by the uh, Southwestern Bell tele Telephone Pioneers. So that's the backstory on the cabin. 
uh, but it's outfitted with everything that you would need if you have a disability. So there's a Hoyer lift in there to lift a patient or somebody. It's got a walk-in like shower that's flush with the floor. Um, there's a hospital bed, a twin-size hospital bed in there. And there's poles to put medicine or IV or such stuff on in there. Um, but dad um, and mother found that, found out about that cabin. It was in the early 90s, about the same time when he was beginning to be most active, working on trying to pass help with the ADA law and get things uh, to be more accessible for people with disabilities. But this was a great cabin. We uh, reserved it as often as possible to, for our family vacations. Um, now, my mother's family always, uh, for years, had a huge family reunion that was held at Lake Tenkiller. And Tenkiller and Greenleaf are real close to each other. And so it was convenient for mother and dad to rent this cabin to stay in in order to not have to drive all the way back to Fort Smith and to come for the reunion activities. So it was really great. Um, and so I've got a, a picture of Jessie, my daughter, back here that you can see that's uh, showing her when we would show up and she was about two years old. She loved to jump out of the car when we would pull up out front and she would run inside and find my mother and tell her to give her some old bread because what she liked to do best of anything is to run down that ramp you see there to the floating dock and feed the fish. So she would throw the bread in the water and the fish would come up. And so when she wasn't able to talk that well, she would tell mother the water is hungry because she didn't understand. She knew that she had to go and feed, you know, put bread, anyway. So there's a picture of her over here just booking it, trying to get down with her bread. She's got her hot dog bun and she's trying to get down to that water. So another story that, you know, there's a million associated with this cabin on the lake. Uh, but another story that I think of when I see this is um, when uh, my daughter was little, again, she was maybe smaller and just she figured out before she would crawl that she could turn and roll. And so she, she wasn't crawling. And I was really frustrated because she would do this weird rolling thing. And uh, so we were at the cabin on the lake and uh, she was on a pallet inside the cabin and uh, I was sitting outside on the porch. There was a screened in porch and I would sit out there with a glass of tea and listen to the cicadas, you know, and listen to the watch of lightning bugs. And I heard my dad in there talking to Jesse and he would say, where's your toy? And and then he, I would hear his wheelchair move. And then she would say, Grandpa, toy. And I was like, what are they doing? What is going on? And then I heard that more than once. And so I got up and I peeked inside. And what it was is on the front of his footrest, he had these little wheels that would turn. And so she was laying on the ground and she would reach up and spin those wheels on his chair. And so he said, I know what I'll do. So he moved his chair back a little bit and she would crawl. And he would, she would spin the wheels and then he would move his chair back some more. And next thing we know, she, he's across the room and she's crawling. <laughs> and so I told everyone that while we were at the cabin that dad taught Jesse how to crawl. So, but just think for a minute, the Southwestern Bell Telephone Pioneers, you know, if they had not built this cabin, you know, it was so great for our family. I'm just thinking how many family memories that, you know, that we would have maybe missed out on. So, all right. So this one, <clears throat> this one is um, Bridge Over Frog Bayou. And I think that he painted this one because of, you know, the spectacle that is the fall colors. When you come over that bridge, if you've ever driven that in the fall, you can see how beautiful that is. And of course, that bridge is really high up. And so you're really looking down. And he was, I think, struck by the, um, you know, that scenery. So um, he just wanted to show that scenery. And if you look in the painting on the left, the white car, I had a white Mitsubishi Gallant. And that's what that, that was my car. And the blue van was there 
old blue van uh, that they had got. So I called that van old blue, and it was maybe the first one that mother and dad got that was outfitted for handicapped people to drive. Um, and so it has special meaning in that that was their independence. Because I promise you, when they got that van and it was outfitted for them, they were not home. <laughs> so again, there's there's that picture of them on, you know, I picture them in there and us and we're going to Fayetteville or, or whatever, so. And I guess that is, I was afraid I would go over, but I didn't. So does anybody have any questions that you want to ask?